Are you suffering from persistent buttocks or hip pain, having sharp, stabby pain that's making sitting intolerable? Hey everyone, this is Dr. Sykes here at Performance Sport and Spine, and these are common symptoms of piriformis syndrome that we'll be discussing in this video. So the piriformis muscle is a flat, pyramidal-shaped muscle that attaches from the sacrum, which is the lower part of your spine, to the top of your femur, or the trochanter head. This muscle's function is to stabilize the hip, i.e. in walking, and then rotate the thigh and upper leg. So in this metaphor, if my fingers are the piriformis, this band is the sciatic nerve. Now 90% of the time the band runs inferior or below the piriformis. Now there is some variation and we'll discuss later in the video if that's problematic or not. So how do you know that the pain you're experiencing is piriformis syndrome? Some cardinal signs and symptoms are the pain should be persistent over your buttocks or hip and kind of a burny or achy feeling. The pain should be worse with sitting. The pain should be bad getting out of bed. And the pain should be worse with hip movements. Some other clinical cues that you and the therapist that you're working with can use is the fader position where you lay on your side and your hip is in flexion and adduction and internal rotation and that puts compression over the piriformis syndrome. That should reproduce the pain. There should be pain with palpation or pressing over the static notch and there's other tension tests for the nerve that should also be able to reproduce your pain. So what is causing the pain that you're experiencing? So basically just think that the muscle is compressing on the nerve causing irritation and inflammation. So this compression of the piriformis on the sciatic nerve can happen for a variety of reasons. So the first one being blunt trauma to the nerve causing damage. The second one would be piriformis hypertrophy, which is an enlargement due to athletic performance. The third would be piriformis spasm. Fourth is prolonged sitting, seen in such occupations as cab drivers and desk workers. Fifth would be weak hip abductors, especially eccentric control. And then six is anatomical variations of both the piriformis muscle and the sciatic nerve. However, we'll go over some studies specifically on this in later in the video. The piriformis can be kind of a tricky condition to diagnose. And in another section, we'll go over greater detail how to differentiate this from other conditions that can present similarly. Since compression is the primary mechanism of this condition, doing things with your posture and your day-to-day -day activity to help reduce that compression can be very beneficial. So some helpful strategies can be removing your wallet from your back pocket, sitting less and especially not sitting more than 30 minutes at one time. When you do sit, using a cushion or donut to help reduce the compression of that area can be very effective. Not sleeping on your side in that fair position with your leg in that flexion and internal rotation causing compression of your piriformis and then reducing the use of high heels. So stretching the piriformis can be very beneficial for this condition. We'll show you a seated version and a supine version next. So we'll go over the seated stretch. So we're going to assume my right hip is the problematic side. You're going to bend your knee into kind of a crisscross position with your lower leg kind of parallel to the floor and bending through our hip we're going to lean forward as far as we can until we feel a nice gentle tension on the posterior buttocks of the piriformis area that we're trying to stretch. We recommend doing this one to two times a day holding up to 20 seconds taking at least five seconds between each rep and going up to five sets per time. For the supine version, assuming my right hip is a problematic side, you're going to cross that leg over the other leg, bring it towards your head, and then use your hands behind your hamstring to kind of pull upwards towards your head until you feel a gentle dull tension in that posterior buttocks. Again, hold to tolerance or to the sets and reps that we previously stated in the other stretch. And again, you should feel gentle dull tension over your posterior gluteal region. Now we're going to go over some great exercises for this condition. Two caveats are, though, that you may require relative rest, not doing much, letting tissues calm down for a little bit before starting them if it's too acute. And we'll set some parameters for sets and dosage, but you may need to tailor it to yourself as every person's different. So now we're going to go over nerve sliders, and these are great for potentially decreasing nerve pain and inflammation. So laying on your back with your feet bent, you're going to place your hands around the affected hamstring. So this is the piriformis that I'm dealing with hypothetically. And keeping that tension with your hands, you're going to slowly try to straighten your knee and press your foot up towards the ceiling. Again, you feel some gentle tension on the back of that hamstring or the buttocks, but it should be tolerable. Now, two important things to note. This can flare it up just as easy as it can help, so you want to start out really slow. We recommend two sets of six reps every other day, and again, it's highly variable. If you do things too fast or too much, you're going to make the condition worse. And then the second leaf is a dynamic stretch. Don't hold at end range. You're not trying to elongate the muscle, you're just trying to gently move to tolerance. So the sideline lateral raise. So you're going to lay on your side with the affected hip up with your leg in line with your spine. You're going to raise your top leg up towards the ceiling, pause with two to three seconds, and then return to the starting position. We recommend two to three sets of eight to ten reps, and again pause for two to three seconds at the top. 
making sure that your leg does not come forward and it maintains in line with the spine for the whole time. And if you need a progression, you can put a band around both ankles and then do the same exercise with more resistance. So another great exercise is the glute bridge. So laying on your back with your feet bent, with your feet pretty close to your glutes, you're gonna drive up to the ceiling with your glutes, making sure to emphasize your buttocks or your glute muscles and not your back. Hold for a few seconds and then come down. Again, we recommend two to three sets of eight to 10 reps, three to four times a week. And sometimes it can be beneficial that if the left hip's the symptomatic side, you bring your left foot closer to your buttocks and your right foot farther away to emphasize that glute. And then again, repeat the asymmetrical bridge to help affect the affected area. And maybe even doing the opposite just to switch things up. So the quadruped hip extension. So on our hands and knees, place a band just above your knees around both legs. And then you're gonna press your leg back at a 45 degree angle to tolerance, hold it for a few seconds, and then come forward. We recommend two sets of six to 10 reps, three to four times a week. And then as you get stronger, increasing the band resistance to make the effort more challenging and the exercise more difficult. As you do it, you wanna feel gentle dull tension over the posterior buttocks, and you don't wanna to shift too much to the other side. You wanna maintain your center of gravity over your hands and legs and making sure you're emphasizing that glute. Now we're gonna go over the single leg deadlift, which is a great end stage rehab for this condition. So grabbing a light weight, we're gonna press one leg backwards to the opposing wall, feeling tension over our glutes and hamstrings. Again, you wanna drive with your leg, rotating your torso through your hip joint, not just bending with your spine. If you're feeling back tension, you're using your back too much, not your hips. Again, press your foot backwards, lowering and controlled, and then come back up. We recommend two to three sets of six to 10 reps, three times a week, and the weight should be Light enough that it's very controlled. And also, if your range of motion gets wobbly, reduce it until you can control it and then gradually progress as you feel more comfortable. So an important thing to clarify right now is that piriformis syndrome is probably not the best name to depict what's going on with this condition. And deep gluteal syndrome is a more accurate name that's used more in the research because more than just the piriformis can compress on the nerve. So as you can see from this image, there's a lot of stuff going on here and there's a lot of structures. So some of the other structures that can compress the nerve are the deep hip rotators, the gluteal and hamstring muscles and tendons, the fibrous bands of the blood vessels, and then other space occupying lesions. So now we're gonna go over how to differentiate this from other conditions that can present somewhat similarly. So the first one is radicular pain or sciatica. And this typically is worse with spinal movements. The leg pain is worse than low back pain. The pain usually passes the knee and is very dermatomal and very specific to a very certain region. If you'd like a more in-depth look at sciatica, we have a clickable link in the notes below. So next we're gonna go over lumbar stenosis, which is narrowing of the central canal of the spine. And we use Cook clusters for this. So the first one is the symptoms are bilateral. The leg pain is worse than the back pain. It's worse with standing or walking. It's better with sitting, and it's most commonly found with people over the age of 48. Gluteal tendinopathy. With this condition, there's tenderness over the greater trochanter. Single leg stance is often weak or painful, and then ortho tests such as Faber and Fader are positive to reproduce the lateral hip pain. For gluteal tendinopathy, if you want a more in-depth video on how to manage this, we have a clickable link in the notes below. So hamstring tendinopathy. So this is painful or weak with resisted knee flexion. Stretching the hamstring often provokes it and there's tenderness over the ischial tuberosity. So the hip joint. With this one, the person would have a very noticeable limp or an antalgic gait. So earlier in the video, we discussed that there was some variance in the piriformis and sciatic structure. And initially this was hypothesized that this would predispose people for this condition. So fortunately, there's these studies of cadavers and MRIs of hips that found that there was no significant correlation between these variances and people suffering from piriformis syndrome. So now we're gonna briefly discuss injections, imaging, and surgery. And they all have some clinical utility for specific cases. So routine imaging is not recommended for this condition as it's mostly a clinical diagnosis. Things like MRI and CT scans are more helpful for ruling out other conditions. And ultrasound appears to be the most cost-effective way of looking directly at the piriformis. So injections have been shown to provide short-term pain relief. A botulinum derivative has been shown to relax the muscle and appears promising a more long-term pain relief, but further research is needed. And then surgery should only be used after conservative care has failed and is no guarantee to fully resolve the problem. Thank you so much for watching our video on piriformis syndrome. We really hope you found it helpful managing this troublesome condition. If you did find it beneficial, please like our video and subscribe to our channel. And as always, if you have any further questions, you can email us directly or leave it in the comments below.